there's there's healthy and unhealthy shame. You know, healthy shame says there's something wrong with you uh, because there's something wrong with all of us and that we, we need Jesus um, to address that thing that's that's really wrong with us. That's That helps us see what we need. Unhealthy shame uh, is, is telling a story about like what's wrong with us is not true. Okay, we're back with Brandon. We're talking uh, about shapes, the things that, the formative influences in our life that um, make us who we are. And uh, this, this episode, this session, I want us to talk about trauma. And I guess the best place to start, because that word can mean so many things to so many people, from a clinical standpoint or in your opinion, like how do you define trauma? Man, there's a lot of different ways that people define this. Um, the, the way that I go back to, uh, and I'll read it in a second, because if I don't read it, I'll, I'll totally botch it, okay. but um, is the, the one that, that we get from uh, the, the APA, uh, the American Psychological Association, um, our psychiatric association, actually, I think. Um, but they define it like this, that trauma is an emotional response to a terrible event like an accident uh, or a rape or natural disaster. Immediately after the event, shock and denial are typical. Longer-term reactions include unpredictable emotions, flashbacks, strained relationships, uh, and even physical symptoms like headaches or nausea. Okay. So based on that definition it would sound like, and I'm asking, that there are different levels of trauma. And the reason I ask that question is because um, I, I know myself, I can't speak for everyone else, I know myself, I tend to think of trauma in like a, it, it, was, a, it was like, a, like a, the worst thing that could possibly ever happen to you. Yeah. And that is true, that would be traumatic. <clears throat> yep. But I'm assuming there are degrees to this in some way? Yeah, there, there's, there's two different... Um, you know, ways to think about it. There's, uh, there are different degrees. There's some things that are more traumatic than others. There's also categories. Um, what we used to describe as trauma, now we know is just only one category of trauma, which is acute trauma. You know, uh, seeing um, the, the violent end of a person or having a near-death experience yourself um, or um, experiencing violence in some particular way, uh, a car crash. Those are all acute instances of trauma. Um, but there's also um, chronic trauma. There's also complex trauma. Uh, and then, you know, I think a fourth category that's newer, but I think is still appropriate, is developmental trauma. And so <clears throat> chronic trauma is going to be a situation where the trauma occurs over long periods of time. <clears throat> like in uh, a, a situation where someone is exposed to some, a set of circumstances you know, the illustration that we were talking about earlier where uh, a very chronic traumatizing thing these days is the the person who's paid by Facebook to like moderate and watch videos before they get published. I'm sure they've seen some really terrible things. And yeah. and so that's, that's chronic. It's not just a single occurrence. Uh, it's happening over a long period of time that's going to affect the way that they um, experience the world around them. That it's, may... not, it's not just affecting them in the moment. No, yeah. It's affecting them for years to come and all trauma has that element to it where um if you've experienced something traumatic the the worst part of the trauma is like it's not like you can like whoa i'm glad we got that over with right. now we can get on with life no that thing is going to hang with you because until the trauma has been worked through um one way or the other it's going to have an effect ongoing so, so pete scazzaro talks a lot about um earthquake events he defines <laughs> them as earthquake events and he, you know, he says, he's, he's using it a lot of times to talk about family of origin. But I remember when I was working through some of his exercises, and as those of us who are believers, you know, I believe the Holy Spirit, when we begin to go down this path of trying to, you know, recognize what's shaping us, I believe the Holy Spirit helps us and sometimes bring, brings memories to mind or things like that. And I know for me, when I was doing some of those exercises, I was able to think of some earthquake moments mm -hmm. in my life. Um, I would never try to put them on the scale of someone who went through sexual abuse or uh, parents divorce and, you know, I had a great childhood, but even in that great childhood, I thought about, uh, you know, not making the, the basketball team in middle school. Mm -hmm. And sometimes I wonder if like, is there a personal opinion element to trauma? Like, can I feel like not making the middle school basketball team was a traumatic event or 
is it just like that was something that was impactful on you, but that's not technically considered trauma. Does that make sense? If that event carries a lifelong impact that um, you find distressing and has affected you in a number of ways and has even in some ways changed the way that your brain functions, then that would have been a traumatic event. Gotcha. Okay, so um, I think there are a lot of people, Brandon, that um, have been through traumatic experiences. Sure. But don't view them or think of them as traumatic experiences. They are so much a part of their life, so much of how they've become who they've become or how they see the world or how they operate within the confines of their family or their marriage. But they would not view it as trauma or even attribute so much of their behavior to those traumatic events. I think about a story I heard one time about a guy who was talking about the way that his dad was physical towards him, uh, physically abusive towards him. And as an adult, he would tell that story like in a joking way, like, yeah, you know, I mean, my dad, like he would get mad sometimes and like hit me and ha 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 ha. And one of his friends one day said, man, that's not funny. And I think there's a lot of things in our past where we maybe we laugh about it or we just talk about it like it was normal, but we don't realize it's traumatic. My question to you is like, how does someone begin to recognize the impact of past experiences in their life? Like they show up to your office one day or they're talking and like, how do we connect the dots to say, oh, okay, maybe, not maybe, that experience 5, 10, 15, 20 years ago is affecting the way that I'm living my life today. How does somebody go about connecting those dots? Yeah, there's <clears throat> there's different instruments that we can use. Instruments are like questionnaires um, to try to get to some of that uh, data or that part of that person's experience. But there's often there's there's typical tells about you know a way the way that a person's living um, that tends to indicate that there may be something traumatic happened in their story. Um, the way that they are resilient or not resilient, the way that they typically find themselves coping or not coping with things. <clears throat> Those are cues that can kind of help us see mm, maybe there's something that's going on back there. Sometimes people in their defensiveness, not in the, a bad way, but in their just self-protective, uh, trying to continue to like live life way, um, have those things blocked. They can't recall them. Uh, or like the story that you're telling, um, they reframe it as a funny thing. So I was going to ask you about that. So the reframing thing. Yeah. Talk a little bit about that because I think that's something we all do, obviously. But like, why do we do that? And what are some ways that we do that? Uh, yeah. So reframing, um, you can think of it as a, as a way to protect or defend yourself. Uh, so we reframe when we're trying to not feel the pain of an event that's in our story. Um, and so we minimize it. We make it funny. Those are the typical ones. Um, but the point is that we want to uh, to not feel the distress of that part of our story. Does that make sense? Yeah. <coughs> so what are some ways that you have seen uh, the average the average person, like there's some scenarios where you've seen the average person reframe things that need to be taken back and unpacked. I think uh, minimizing it is a big one. Uh, making a joke out of it is another one. Uh, the way that people typically, like there's a, a, a hot take on the internet that's pretty popular, I've seen about this, that, that essentially says like, hey, if you've got a chip on your shoulder because you've gone through some really hard things, and so you tell people that are also going through really hard things like, to, to like suck get on up. with it, like suck it up, I'm fine, look at me. Uh -huh. Like you're not fine. <laughs> you know, like that, that's an indicator that you're not okay, you're not doing well if, um, if that's the way that you're projecting that experience onto other people. Um, and so there's, it goes back to the sense of like resiliency that I think that all of our souls have been given thanks to God and the way that he's built us where when really bad things happen, we, we desire to live. And so we, our brains and our bodies will do things to try to help keep us here. Um, like the, the, the first defense mechanism that you pip typically get as an infant is going to be dissociation, where if, um, if your caregiver leaves you in a dirty diaper too long and you're crying and they don't hear your cries, 
um, the pain of sitting in that is going to become overwhelming. And so an infant's able to emotionally and physically dissociate from the pain. <clears throat> but it doesn't just stop there. We, we hang on to that one. And so our defenses are like these protectors that we've been given, like babysitters almost, that we've overgrown or outgrown, I guess. Uh, and so we carry those into, um, into life. And uh, traumatic uh, events, we, we can respond to defensively as well. Like we can totally forget them. You know, I've had a number of clients um, that uh, have remembered some things throughout the course of therapy. We have to be really careful about that so that we're not creating false memories. And so we, we don't want to be overly directive. And so it's, that's a thing that, you know, I'm personally concerned about. But people do remember things after, you know, creating a space that's safe enough. And that's typically the way that, because when they do, like something terrible happened 40 years ago, and now you're remembering it. And you, you're like, wait a second, how did I forget that? Yeah. I know, well, I know Malcolm Gladwell has done some talk about like how we can't trust our memories. Mm -hmm. One of his books talking to strangers is kind of about that, but like, what's your take on that about, you know, 20 years later, 30 years later, memories start coming back. Like yeah. how much can we trust the details of those stories? It depends. You know, um, there's a lot of, of research data that says that if therapists are overly directive about helping people try to recover those things, then the directiveness of the therapist might be creating some of those memories in the first place. We want to be really careful. Um, on the other hand, though, if you're just inviting people to sort of like recall their story and that your cues are general enough that you're not saying, um, I really want you to think about like whether or not any of the men in your family might have been physically abusive. And then they're like, well, I don't really remember anything, but like, I, would, I never felt very safe around my uncle. And you're like, well, tell me more about that uncle. Right, you know, right. you really start pushing into it. Before you know it, you could start creating something that's not really there. Right. Um, versus <clears throat> someone saying, you know, as I think about my childhood, I'm noticing that I don't have a lot of memories between like fourth and sixth grade. Okay, well, tell me what you do remember about fourth grade, you know, in sixth grade. And... Like, are there some things you're like, oh, yeah, and this was my teacher. And for my birthday that, that year, I got this. And then and then sometimes as they're trying to recall that stuff, they're like, oh, wait a second. I totally forgot about this thing that, that occurred. And then the question is always um, when someone, when that uh, happens, why did that, where did that go? Like, how did I forget that? Like, why would I, like, they almost have a sense of, like, um, frustration with their mind and their body. They're like, why did I do that to myself? Yeah. And the truth is, is like that thing was really traumatic that happened to you and your body and your brain, the subconscious parts of you made a decision. You weren't ready to confront that yet. To survive. Yeah. It's a survival skill. It's one that maybe uh, we, not maybe, we should attribute to God as a form of grace that, um, that people do forget those things for a long time. So they're really removed from those circumstances and then they're able to work through them because they're in a place in life where things have slowed down enough or they have the resources to be able to, yeah. to work through the, that particular event in their story. And, and again, I mean, I'm not by any means putting my story up against other people's tragic stories, but I know even as you and I have worked together, as I just begin to invite the Holy Spirit in to help me, you know, Psalm 139, search me, oh God, point out anything. Like as I, even as I just open myself up to begin to try to recognize how my past has shaped me in some ways, I do begin to remember things that I had forgotten. Mm -hmm. I mean, do you feel like that's a spiritual element of this process? Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So I am curious. I want to ask you about this. I am curious when these memories start coming back or maybe not even coming back, but we have them. How does shame come into play in this? Because I know you and I talk a lot about shame and how shame is usually... It's that secondary emotion that is trying to keep us from experiencing a primary emotion. Yeah. If I said that right. But you did. So many people feel ashamed or take personal responsibility for traumatic things that happen to them. Mm -hmm. You know, a, a, a big stereotypical one would be like a child feeling like their parents' divorce is their fault. Yep. I know there are lots of other examples of that. But how does shame come into play and how do we combat that? So I would like there's there's healthy and unhealthy shame. You know, healthy shame says there's something wrong with you uh, because there's something wrong with all of us, and that we we need Jesus um, to address that thing that's that's really wrong with us. That's that helps us see what we need. Um, 
unhealthy shame uh, is is telling a story about like what's wrong with us that's not true. Like the the child that that takes responsibility for their parents' divorce. In that situation, then we what we've done is, or what that child's done, is in their sense of scarcity, they've over realized their scarcity that's now been stretched to explain something that's really terrible. Okay, you got to explain that in their scarcity, <clears throat> overstretched their scarcity. What do you mean? Yeah, so like um, they, we're we all have scarcity. Yeah. We're all uh, limited beings um, as we've been created. We're we're imperfect. And a child in a situation like that can assume that the reason that this bad thing has happened is related to a bad thing about them. Okay. And so there's like resonance somehow between the, the, the realization of their parents getting a divorce and the, the feeling that they have about like, this is not a good thing. Um, I wonder if I'm somehow to, to blame for this. I'm responsible in some way. Uh, maybe if I weren't here, they wouldn't be getting divorced, um, <clears throat> and so they're they're wrapping their shame almost around that situation as an, as a reason or an explanation for why that might be happening. What yeah. happens to us if we never? I, I don't. I want to ask this question. What happens to us if we never address the trauma in our lives? And I, I guess I mean that in the sense of once the Holy Spirit begins to bring things to mind, or or we are beginning to look at things that have happened. What happens if we don't address it? I mean, I think denial, like people would say like, I just, I'm just not even going to go there. Like what, what are the ramifications of that? If somebody says like, that's too painful, I'm not going to deal with that. The, um, the things that it's been said to me this way, and I think it's helpful. Um, the things that we intentionally or unintentionally block, uh, we just stop seeing, but that doesn't mean that they stop being drivers in our lives. And so there's things that happen in our stories that if we just like pretend didn't exist or maybe even forgot, it doesn't mean that those things don't have an impact any longer because we've forgotten them or because we blocked them. It just means that we can't see how that they're, they're influencing us in the way that we are. And in one way, you know, <clears throat> it could be that a person experienced some trauma at a young age and... Uh, like one of the ways that they dealt with their shame is they decided that they were going to make sure they were always enough, you know? Uh. So they never feel that again. And then like, as they've gotten older, they're like, I don't, something, it's not adding up. Everyone thinks I'm a jerk, hmm. you know? And, uh, and they're just aware of like, I just, you know, I, I don't ever want to feel that again. And so I need to make sure that I show up with enough or more than enough you know, in all these different situations, and they're unaware that that typically is is being relationally communicated to other people as like, nah, he's, you know, he's just kind of a jerk. Would this be similar to childhood wounds? I mean, we don't want to get into the whole Enneagram discussion, yeah. but I, like where motivation comes, you talk about people, you know, as an adult, people, you realize people think you're a jer jerk, but it's also like always feeling the need to be funny or feeling the need to be competent or feeling the need to be a winner or fit. Is, is a lot of our motivation or driven from the wounds or the traumatic events of our childhood? I think so. Uh, the, the unrealized ones are unresolved ones, I guess we should say. Like then, then we're living in a place that, that subconsciously the message is, if I do this, uh, then I don't have to experience this again. And so if I'm funny and I know that this works, then I can avoid that. And so I'm going to do this to avoid that. And in trauma, uh, it's it's even more exaggerated um, that uh, there's parts of their story, like when, when trauma occurs, um, the way that our brains function is sort of is, is affected. Um, our memory systems are affected. Our threat detection systems are affected. And um, some of the shame that people feel now about that is um, they experience anxiety because of their trauma. Is it wrong to say that, let me ask it this way, why does it feel like traumatic events happen more often in childhood than later in life? Is it because we're more impressionable? Are we having just as many traumatic events happen to us later in life as in childhood, but we view them differently? Like, what would be your answer for that? 
Uh, I mean, who's the most vulnerable? Yeah. So like vulnerability has a lot to do with it. Children have, there are lots of ways that they're vulnerable to lots of different circumstances and people. Uh, they don't have very much power. They don't have much agency. Their brains aren't fully developed. And so there's a lot of different ways that they could experience trauma. And the other thing too is, uh, is that kids are constantly using the brains of adults because their brains aren't developed. There's this thing that, that we are able to do um, as children and adults uh, where we take advantage of this part of our um, neural structures called mirror neurons where we're able to sort of like use the brain of another person and feel things. It's where empathy comes from. But it's also the part of us, like if you think about your kids when they were really little um, and you're, you're out for a walk and they're, they run out ahead of you and they trip and stumble and they scrape their knee and they look back to see like, you know, what's mom and dad going to think about this? Mm-hmm. And if mom or dad is really distraught, then, they're, then they get really distraught. This is bad. They think it's bad. I think it's bad. Uh, but if mom or dad's like, they they sort of assess the situation and they're like, no, it looks, you're okay. Mm-hmm. You're safe. Then they're like, okay, I'm fine. Yeah. You know, and they, they don't, then their reaction mirrors their parents' reaction. So specifically for those of us who are uh, Christians or people of faith, you know, part of the gospel message is that when we put our faith in Christ, we're new creatures. Yeah. New creation. Old things have passed away. Roman says, you know, we become new. And that is 100% true. I mean, I think a lot of Dallas Willard writings about, you know, it's grace that brings us to Christ and faith in Jesus based totally on what Jesus did. And we are new creations, but we still have those old, you know, I think of uh, Romans 12, you know, about the, the way our mind works being transformed by the renewing of our mind. So, so someone who comes to Christ puts their faith in Jesus and... Ha- is a new has a new heart has a new spirit that Jesus Christ come in, but there are still traumatic events for their past. How does someone who is a new creation also like? How do we begin the process, or how do those two things? I guess my question is not making any sense. Mm. How do those two things coexist? I am a new creature in Christ, sure, but I but my old person that has been shaped went through so many things that have really messed me up. Mm -hmm. How do those two things coexist? It's a good question. I mean, think about that. Let's talk about a car wreck trauma. And imagine that, you know, as a child, you were in a really bad car accident. Um, And the, the accident like broke your hip and you had an operation and it kind of fixed it, but you, you've walked with a limp ever since. And then you become a believer. Um, we no one hears that story and assumes that because the person's now trusting in Christ, that they don't walk with a limp any longer huh. from the trauma that they experienced where their their hip was broken. So why would we expect that someone that comes to Jesus and is putting their faith in Jesus would have another part of their body that was affected by that experience automatically just dramatically change? because of uh, the faith that they have in Christ. I don't think that we should. And honestly, like that doesn't, like God is more interested in this story, right? The Bible is this wonderful story that's that's taking thousands of years to like write and experience and, and the characters in it expand millennia. And so to think that God is only interested in our stories by sort of like finger snap moments of like, you were totally this thing and now you're totally that thing. And there's no, there's no story. There's no transition. There's no um, person putting their faith in Christ and then struggling forward because that's a beautiful thing versus like the story. And, you know, no one wants to see the movie where, you know, this guy believes in Jesus and then like he just sits in a room and eats saltine crackers until he dies, you know, 50 years later. There's no, that's not beautiful. But the idea that like um, a person came from a really difficult family and despite all the odds has sort of come to a place where they can trust that uh, God as their father is not like God as their earthly father and that Jesus as their brother is not like Jesus is not like their earthly brother and to trust them and to struggle through all of the the anxiety that they still experience because of the trauma that they went through because you got to remember like the, the part of your brain that's detecting threat, that's sort of like sig- signaling anxiety, 
like the danger, this isn't safe, is 20 times faster than the part of your brain that's logical. And so when, when we see in the Bible, it's like, don't be anxious. Um, we really, we don't mean that the same way that we understand anxiety today, or we shouldn't say it that way. Uh, really what, what's being gotten at there, I think, is a type of uh, worry that's really oriented to more like idolatry versus the way that we understand anxiety as like our response to something automatically without us necessarily thinking about it first. Like if a, if a person that's been in war is at a fireworks show and the fireworks go off and without thinking they feel anxious, is that sin? They're disobeying the Bible? No. Right. Yeah, they didn't, they didn't even have a thought about that. They, that happened subconsciously, pre-consciously before they could think about it. And so to, to allow someone to um, participate in their shame and to keep pushing it in that direction um, because the Bible says to not be anxious is a misunderstanding and misapplication of Scripture. And I think, I think it also speaks to the fact that, you know, our stories, that God has orchestrated our stories, not that he's responsible for everything that's happened to us, but for us to kind of shortchange that whatever happened in your past should just be gone is discounting a lot of what God, the ingredients God uses in our, in our future. Like who, who I was is, is the ingredients of that God uses to to continue to make me who I am and, and also to you know, help other people at certain times, uh, whatever too. 